to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the king of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love If more of you means less of me Take everything Yes, all of you
Welcome to our online service. It's so good to have you with us and I'm glad that you joined us. My name is Paul, I'm one of the pastors here and I just wanna give you a warm welcome. Maybe you're here for the very first time or you've only been here a couple times. May I encourage you to just let us know that you're here by completing the connect card found on our website at southridgefellowship.ca. That, if you click on that and complete it out, we will mail you a gift card for coffee on us so that you can uh, just take the time to let us know who you are and we get to embrace you and just to get to know you a little bit better as well and fill you in a little bit about what our church is all about. It's to help you feel comfortable with our church family and know what we're about to join us as we serve God together. As we can uh, carry on in our service, as we welcome Pastor Brent back from his sabbatical and, and back to the first time preaching, I just have a couple of announcements that I just want to highlight for you. The first one is that on August 20th, that's a Saturday, we have Summer Splash happening again from 11 until 2. You don't want to miss that. It's a great opportunity for you to invite your friends and come together uh, as we fulfill our mission of engaging the mission together. It gives us an opportunity to invite our friends to something that's a lot of fun. There's no pressure whatsoever, but they get a lot of fun in water and with our go-karts and then just with some great activities that we have that they'll be sure to remember for many weeks throughout the summer. So we hope you join us. Now, if you're not, uh, if you don't have anybody to invite, maybe you want to come and serve. It's a great serving opportunity. So you can sign up by just contacting the church office and saying, hey, I want to sign up for Summer Splash and we'll find a spot for you. And we'd love to have you join us. That's Saturday, August the 20th. You don't want to miss it. It starts at 11 a.m. Come everyone, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, other than that, there's a lot of other things that are taking place in our ministries. Uh, some of them have some great uh, summer activities like our youth. Uh, our children are continuing to meet throughout the weekend as well uh, during the services and they're doing a great thing uh, as they engage uh, on a, an adventure together. And so if maybe you haven't been part of it yet, we'd invite you to come in person. We'd love to have you join us for that. Those are all the announcements that we have. We'd encourage you to check out our website just to get caught up on all of the up-to-date uh, details of any of the things coming up. You go to southridgefellowship.ca and we'd love to have you join us in that. You know, part of our mission as well as a church is as we engage our community, as we serve our community, as we bring them Jesus, is to wait to just uh, opportunity to meet specific needs, sometimes financial, sometimes practical. It's one of the ways that we have to offer to give. Uh, it's one of the things that we use with the uh, offerings that are given uh, on a weekly basis. So if you're giving today, we want to thank you for that. There's many different ways you can give on our website at southridgefellowship.ca slash give. Uh, and then we would just welcome you to participate with us as we serve and care for our community as well. Let's look forward to our time of getting into God's Word with Pastor Brent. Grab your Bibles, maybe something to drink, and let's dig into God's Word together. When you hear the word blessed, what comes to your mind? You know what? Uh, that word was forever changed for me, like 
10 years ago, 11 years ago, when my kids, when they were in middle school, showed me a video that centered around this word blessed. And so I thought I would bless you by showing you that same video. So take a look at it. Hold it right there. Do you still say grace before you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner? If you answered yes, then I've got a product that's going to revolutionize the way you do food. Pre-blessed food! That's right, pre-blessed food. We pray for it so you don't have to. This is the 21st century, folks. We can sell anything. Around the clock, we've got thousands of employees buying brand name foods, praying over them, and then putting them back on the shelves of your local grocery store. With our official sticker of approval, we've got breakfast cereal. Pre-blessed! Lunch meat. Pre-blessed! TV dinners. Double pre -blessed. And if you don't want a white guy praying over your food, we've got that too. Please, Lord, bless these eggs, Father. Bless the chicken that had these eggs, Father. Just listen to how pre-blessed food changed these people's lives. Since I switched to pre-blessed food, ain't nothing changed. We've always prayed religiously before eating, but we've been so busy with work and watching TV. Pre-blessed food hasn't only saved us time, it saved our souls. But that's not all. No, 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 that's not all. Inside every package of pre-blessed food are two tickets to heaven. Share them with your friends and family to make sure they go upstairs when they fall downstairs. So visit your local grocery store today and look for our official sticker of approval. And the next time someone asks you to bless the food, you say, it's unbeen blessed. <laughs> Double pre-blessed. Pretty funny, I know. I don't. Maybe it was too sacrilegious for you, I'm not sure. I found it hilarious watching that video. And you know when you hear something, it just never will leave your mind? You will never forget pre-blessed, will you? Uh, in fact, I, it's been like 12 years, 10 years since I've watched that video for the first time. And there are times when I pull out that word and use it. Like if someone's late for dinner, I say, hey, don't worry, Jaden. Don't worry, Kieran. Food's pre-blessed. Because we've already prayed for it, right? And um, I think, you know, this tagline that we prayed for it so you don't have to kind of speaks to us on some level. Because it means, because we're all, we're all looking for ways to cut things out of our life that take time, right? And so, so we have more important you know, time for the more important things in our life. And sometimes we can approach even the mundane things, the repetitive things like praying for breakfast or dinner or lunch with that mindset. Pre-blessed appeals to us because it means we have received the blessing without having to do the work. That's what pre-blessed means, right? You didn't pray for it, but you received the blessing of a blessed meal. And so it really appeals to us. And, and as I was thinking about this, this whole idea of pre-blessed, this idea of, of getting something that we didn't work for, it started me thinking down the road, what else do we not understand about this term blessed or blessing? And you know what we do when we don't understand something or when we want to find out something, right? We go to the internet. So I typed into the internet, what does blessing mean? And, and I came across this list. And so I thought I'd share it with you. It says this, uh, what are the signs of blessing? And it says this, your prayers are answered. You and your loved ones are healthy. That sounds good. You have a grateful heart. Your needs are well provided. You've received overflowing resources. You have the heart and the means to give to the needy. You are successful in everything that you do. You experience favor wherever you go. That sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? But is it true? When the Bible talks about being blessed, is, does that what it means? Or does it mean something entirely different? I think we're a little confused because we live in an age of marketing where advertisers are trying and they're bombarding us with these messages that if you're missing something or if we can do something for you that saves you time, that is a blessing, right? Like if you can get something you're missing, that's a blessing. And it sounds amazing, right? That if we were successful, if, if these things happened to us, our life would be more comfortable, because that's what we want, isn't it? But is that truly what it means to be blessed? 
I thought we would spend some time looking in Psalms in this, around this term, what it means to be blessed, because after all, we are in a Psalm series this summer, so it's a good idea, right? And so if you have your Bibles, just turn them to Psalm 119, and we're going to get there. I'm just going to take a small detour to Psalm number one, and I'm going to read you verses one and two from Psalm number one as you're turning to Psalm 119, and this is what it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. So you have this one picture of what it means to be blessed. It means that you're not walking with the wicked or sinners, but you're meditating on God's word. And then you get to Psalm 119 and look at the first two verses. And it says this, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. In Psalms, the concept of blessing is really tied with this uh, concept of wisdom. It's the wise who are blessed. It's not about happiness. It's not about material possessions. That's not what brings blessing. That's not the end result of blessing. And there's this image in Psalm that when we're talking about blessing, it's this, it's this place that you arrive at where you have to choose between two paths. The path of the wicked, which looks like it will lead to blessing, or the path of following God's word, the Torah, God's law, that will bring you blessing. Over uh, a period of 90 days, just a little while ago, uh, I decided to read the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7. I decided to read those three chapters 50 times in a period of 90 days. And let me tell you, it is not as easy as you might think. First of all, (laughs) it is annoyingly convicting to read the Sermon on the Mount that many times. But second, you know what I started to notice? I started to notice that the words that Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount and the topics that he touches on in the Sermon on the Mount are things that saturate our life. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Pam and I were at a service and I kept leaning over to her when someone would say something or there'd be a song. I'd go, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. I think she got annoyed with me the amount of times I said Sermon on the Mount, just drawing her attention to aspects of Sermon on the Mount that were being highlighted in the service. It was like I had Sermon on the Mount goggles put on because everywhere I look, I see these things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. And so when, when we talk about blessing, it's pretty hard not to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, at the very beginning, Jesus goes through this long list of what it means to be blessed or those who are blessed in the kingdom of God. And so let me just give you my kind of translation of what Jesus says in those first few verses. He says this, you are blessed if you are humble. You are blessed if you suffer loss and you mourn. You are blessed if you are content with just who you are. And I stole that one from Eugene Peterson's message. But you are blessed if you pursue righteousness. Not pursue money, not pursue love, not pursue even family. Righteousness. You are blessed if you are wronged by someone and yet you still show them mercy. You are blessed if you are pure in heart. You are blessed if you are a peacemaker. Not just a peacekeeper, but actually someone who makes the peace. And you are blessed when you are persecuted because you follow Jesus. That list sounds nothing like the list that I found on the internet, does it? I mean, where are the overflowing resources? Where's the success in everything I do? Where's the favor for wherever I go? I like that list. I'm not so much sure that I like the list that Jesus gives me. You see, Jesus' blessings seem more like anti-blessings than real things that I want to strive for, right? So how do we end up with two very different lists of what blessings look like? How do we know which one to follow? 
Let's go back to Psalm chapter 1 and just look at that because we are reminded that there are two paths. The path that goes to where the wicked go and the path that goes for those who follow the law of God. Maybe you've heard that two-path analogy before. Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says these words, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to what? Life. And only a few find it. Psalm 1 tells us about the person who has to choose the road that they're going to walk on. And it tells us not to choose the wide road, not to choose the road that the sinner goes down, the mocker, the wicked person, but to choose the law of the Lord. And Psalm 19 continues this thought where it tells us the blessed walk according to the law of the Lord. They keep the statutes. They seek him with all their hearts. You see, Psalm 19 tells us that the blessing we need is not always the blessing we want if we're really honest. You see, we want health. Let me tell you, I want health. You want health for yourself and for your loved ones. We want provisions. We don't want to be in need. We want overflowing resources. We want success in whatever we do because that makes us feel good. We want a comfortable life because I think we believe That if we have a comfortable life, we'll actually be satisfied with all these things. Not realizing that those things end up sucking the life from us. Not giving us life. It's only the narrow path, Jesus tells us, that brings us to life. Only the blessings that Jesus talks about are the things that actually bring us life. Only following that path will bring us to life. Which is why Psalm 119 is so important. You know how important it is? Psalm 119 is an extended meditation on God's revelation, God's word. And and it goes through for 176 verses. It tells us how important God's word is, how life-giving it is. And it tells us that it is actually the path, God's word, that will lead us to God. So let me just biblically geek out for a moment on Psalm 119. I've already shared it has 176 verses. That means it's the longest, biggest, psalm in the Old Testament. It's also the longest chapter in the Bible. And it is made up of 22 sections. That there's one section for each of the Hebrew alphabet, letters in the alphabet, 22, right? So there's 22 sections, and each section or strophe My English Lit 12 teacher would be just beaming right now, me using strophe. So each strophe has eight verses in it. And the psalm is arranged in an acrostic format, so it follows the Hebrew alphabet. And here's what's amazing. This psalm had to be 176 verses. For 22 sections, eight verses each section, 176. That's pretty amazing, right, eh? And here's the thing, you could see that if you just took the time to look at Psalm 119. But there would be one thing that you would probably miss unless, unless you spoke Hebrew or knew how to read Hebrew and you read Psalm 119 from your Hebrew Bible. For in each of the 22 sections, each section, each verse starts with the letter of that section. And I've got an example for you. I just want to show you so you can see it's Hebrew. I'm not expecting you to read it. But if you notice, and in Hebrew, they don't read from left to right like we do in English. They read from right to left. And so I've circled the letters. And so you can see that in the first eight verses, it all starts with the same Hebrew letter. Pretty amazing, eh? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that cool? But let me just read... The first eight verses of Hebrew uh, uh, Psalms 119. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. 
Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Now, there's something in here that I hope you caught. And if you didn't, I want to show you visually uh, that. So if you're listening to this, you need to pull over or stop, pull out your Bible and look at, with me in this. But here's, here's a graphic for you to look at of these eight verses. And notice the words that I've underlined. There are eight words that I've underlined in the eight verses. There's the word law in verse 1, which is the, a translation of the word Torah. And Torah literally means instruction or teaching. It's not the same thing as we think of as law, like, you know, rigid things that are written down and official in that sense. There, it's more about instruction and teaching. And then in verse 2, you have statutes. In verse 3, it's ways. Verse 4, it's precepts. In verses 5 and 8, the word is decrees. In verse 6, it's commands. In verse 7, it's laws. And so you see in all eight verses, there is one form or another synonyms of God's law, of God's Torah. In fact, it, when you read all 176 verses, depending on the translation you're using, it'll either be in 171 of the verses or 173 of the verses, you will find a synonym that refers to the law, the Torah. The psalmist is trying to tell us something, that God's law is important for our life. <laughs> you know, I may be a little dense, but I'm not that slow to miss the message in this psalm. You see, the psalmist is telling us that the pathway to blessing is actually through God's word. If we want to live a blessed life, we have to seriously take God's word. We have to seriously look at it, learn it, invest ourselves into it. The path of blessing is through God's word. There's a Jewish tradition that says King David, even though we don't know who wrote this psalm, that King David used this psalm to teach his son Solomon when he was young. And he taught him both the Greek, or sorry, Greek, the Hebrew alphabet, because there's 22 letters in it, he used it to teach him the Hebrew alphabet, but he also taught, taught him uh, the alphabet for spiritual life, how to be blessed in life. William Wilberforce, the leader of the movement that led the movement to abolishing slavery in England in the 1800s, it is said that when he would walk to his home from Parliament, he would recite Psalm 119 from memory on his way home. Not a bad, not a bad thing, not a bad psalm to learn. Let me just point out a few things about these first eight verses of Psalm 119. There's three things that I kind of want to leave with you in this message. And, it, and it's the three things that I think this psalm, the psalmist is telling us characterizes those who are blessed from a biblical perspective. The first thing is this, the blessed walk in ways that are blameless. We see this in verse one, blessed are those whose ways are blameless. And then you jump down to verse three, he adds, they do no wrong. I don't know about you, but when you read that, how do you feel? My feeling is that most of us hearing this message will say, hey, Brent, you know what? <laughs> I'm out. That path is too hard. How do I walk a path where I'm blameless? How do I live life where I do no wrong? How do I do that? And yet, when you get to the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul talks to the church and he's talking, uh, he says, you know what, those of you who are part of God's holy people, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And then he goes on and says this, he says that we have been chosen to be holy and blameless in God's sight, meaning that it's possible to be blameless and so what is the psalmist trying to say here? What do we need to know in order to walk in a way that is blameless? First of all, I think when you look at it through a New Testament perspective, we are able to be blameless because of Jesus' work on the cross. You know, it's through his death and resurrection 
that we are able to have his righteousness, meaning that because he lived a blameless life, the only person to ever live a truly blameless life, because he lived that blameless life and he died for you and I, we are able to take his blamelessness and say it's our blamelessness before God and God recognizes it. You see, so that's in that sense, in that sense, our salvation is pre-blessed. Someone else has done the work for us and we are receiving the benefit of that work. Christ's death allows us to be blameless before God. But there's also a human component. There's also a component that we need to do in this, in this journey, in this road, in our life. You see, the Hebrew term for blamelessness also has these connotations of integrity or honesty. And so I think one of the aspects that the psalmist is trying to remind us here is that if we're going to walk blamelessly before God... We have to take the time and have the integrity to evaluate our life. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to see ourselves as we truly are, sin and all. We have to understand that we would naturally choose to go down the wrong path. We would naturally be drawn to the wide road. We don't naturally walk the narrow road. And that even while we're on the narrow road, we still sin. We have to be honest with ourselves in that. And I think the second thing after uh, the psalmist helps us understand that the blessed are the, are the blessed walk in the ways that are blameless, he says, the blessed walk and keep the Torah. That's verse one, the law there, the law of the Lord is the Torah. And so what is the psalmist saying here? I think there's a tension that he is allowing us to step into. You know, we may have the desire to walk and follow God's law, but in verses four and five, he shows us what this tension looks like. He says, you have laid down your precepts, meaning talking about God, and they are to be fully obeyed. And then he goes on to say, oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. The psalmist is you know, living life and he's acknowledging how hard it is sometimes to follow God's laws. Following God's laws can be difficult. You see, the problem isn't that God laid down his precepts to be obeyed, his statutes, his decrees. The problem is, is that I'm not sure I will obey them or I'm not sure I want to obey them. You know, I may be tempted to sin, so I'm not sure I will actually obey what God wants me to do. Or I may not want to obey what God is telling me to do because, one, I may just disagree with it. Or I may not understand why God is asking me to do that. And so sometimes we come to the place where in our minds we don't actually think God's precepts are right for us. And so we argue with God, resisting obeying what he has said for us. That's why the psalmist in verse 5 says, look, my ways are not steadfast, knowing that he's going to fail either through temptation or willful disobedience. He's going to have a hard time. Let me give you an example. You know, in the whole area of sex, it is one thing to be tempted to have sex before you're married. Right? You have a boyfriend, you have a girlfriend, you're in a serious relationship. You know, things may get carried a little bit too far and you're tempted to just, you know, go past where you had made agreements to stop. You know, that may happen. It's a temptation. But you may be at the place where you're in that relationship and you may not even agree with God's law. You may not think fornicating, there's anything wrong with fornication, having sex before marriage. And you're just telling God, I don't agree with your law. Or you may even take it a step further. And when God says sex is reserved for marriage between a man and a woman, you think, God, that's so old school. You know, you're so out of step with modern times, with current culture. You need to change that thinking, God. And so we come to this place where we start debating whether we should obey God's law, whether we agree with God's law, not wholeheartedly going, okay, God, this is your law and I'm willing to obey it. 
And that's only part of the problem, though. Because in verse 5, he goes on uh, after, after saying, you know what, I wish I were steadfast. I wish I wouldn't fall into temptation. He goes on to verse 6 and says this, Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commandments. You see, one of the things that happens to us when we disobey God's laws, either through temptation or willful disobedience, we end up suffering shame. And the psalmist points out there's two things here, consideration and shame. You see, God's word is supposed to act as a mirror to our lives so that when we look at God's law, his word, when we consider his commandments, as the verse said, we're supposed to evaluate our life compared to what God says is the standard, what God says is the path we should be going down. And if we do this well, if we do it, you know, with intention to actually live out what God has called us, the psalmist is telling us that, you know, when we shine the Torah on our life, it will shine back to us revealing things that are not in step with God's law. Things where we are at a variant with what God is saying we should be at. Verse 11, which we're not going to really look at, says we are to hide God's word in our heart. In essence, what the psalmist is saying here, I think, is we are supposed to know God's word so well that instead of having Mount, uh, you know, Sermon on the Mount goggles when you look at things, you're supposed to have God's word goggles. So that whenever you look at something, whatever you experience, whatever, whenever you're in a discussion, you know God's word so well, his commandments so deeply inside of you that you know when it is wrong, when it is against what God wants for your life. And you're aware of that. You see, what the psalmist is saying is, is that when that happens in our life, when we realize that we are not walking the path we should, the result of it is actually shame. You see, shame is a natural reaction to when we sin. It's what Genesis says happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned, right? What was the result? They felt shame. Shame is actually a healthy thing for us in relation to sin. Because shame lets us know when we are in violation of God's word, when we are sinning. And if used properly, shame puts us on the right path back to God. And shame is actually a gift in that moment, but only if we use it properly. I've noticed over the last little while that increasingly there is a lack of shame even in the church. Those who call themselves Christians. They're not shameful about any of their actions. And I wonder if it's because these Christians who call themselves Christians don't actually know God's word. They have not spent time considering God's word. They have not spent time hiding God's word in their heart. So they don't even know it's a sin. They are so blinded to it. Or is it just the fact fact that they have no intention of living out God's law? God, you don't know what you're doing. I'm turning my back on you. I'm going to live how I want to live. Is it no wonder with that as kind of a rampant aspect of our Christianity in North America, that we don't live as a blessed church. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you experienced shame in your life because you sinned? Was it the last few days? Was it in the last week? Was it in the last month? Let me suggest to you that if you have not felt shame recently, (laughs) that things aren't quite right in your life. Because you and I are way too big of sinners to go a whole month without feeling some sort of shame. I should know. I was preparing this message this week, and there was something that as I was working through this, God kept bringing to me, and I was reminded of some unkind words that I had said to somebody, and it... It drove me to the place where I needed to go to them and apologize and confess my sin to them in order to deal with the shame 
that God was placing in me because I knew I had sinned. What about you? Have you experienced that type of shame in the last little while? Have you been in God's word enough to even have that as a, as a mirror to let you know that you should be feeling shame for some of your actions, some of your words that you have said? You see, they say confession is good for the soul, and it is because it is the way to deal with shame. We confess our sin to God, and then we confess our sin to someone else if we have wronged them or hurt them, and we ask for forgiveness. Right? That's the proper mechanism of shame. That's where it should lead to for a Christian. So that's two of the three things that the psalmist is trying to tell us. The blessed walk in the ways that are blameless. The blessed walk and keep the Torah. And then the last one, the third one, is the blessed seek God with all their hearts. That's what it says at the end of verse 2, doesn't it? And then he confirms it in verse 7, saying, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Notice the transition from shame to praise. The transformation that takes place when we deal with our sin appropriately, when we deal with our shame appropriately, when we confess it and deal with it, it moves from a place where I'm ashamed and shameful of my actions to a place where I can once again praise God with an upright heart. That's what he's saying, an upright heart. That word in Hebrew means an agreement with, meaning that you're praising God because you agree with who he is and what he says. Here's the thing. You will not be able to praise God in the way you should be praising God if there is sin in your life. Sin stops us from having that upright heart. Praise only occurs when our heart is right before God and our heart is right with others. That's when it's free to praise, to, that where we can praise God wholeheartedly. So let me ask you, have you been able to praise God today? Maybe there's something that is in your life right now that God is saying you need to deal with because you aren't able to praise God like the way you should be able to. This transformation that the psalmist is talking about goes from sin to shame to confession to repentance. It's the message of the gospel. We are able to do this because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus' death leads to a restoration of us with God. But it's a reminder that we are to seek him with all our hearts. Are you seeking God with all your heart? Or are you just living a life of moral goodness? You see, that's the downside of just following the first two. You can be on the path to blamelessness, trying to act pro- appropriately, walk well. You can, you know, know your Bible and keep it. But that's just externals. Those are external things. And the psalmist tells us we need external obedience, but we also need an internal love of Jesus in our hearts here. It's both things that we need And when we have a love for Jesus, a love for God, a love for his word, it will lead to action. And the psalmist ends this section by saying, I will praise and I will obey. I will praise God for who he is and the laws that he has laid down. And I will obey those laws. So what path are you walking down right now? Is it the wide path or is it the narrow path? You see, salvation is not on the comfortable, wide road. I wish it were. I wish it were salvation came in in an easy format where things just came easy and we didn't face any hardships and God didn't ask us to do difficult things. I wish that were the case, but that's not the case. The Bible clearly tells us that salvation comes on the narrow road It is the hard road. It is the difficult road. But that is the road where we find God. And that is the road where we find life. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now about something? Something you need to do. Something that you feel shame about right now. Something that you need to go, relationship you need to make right with someone. Something you need to confess. 
I encourage you, confess, apologize, repent, get back on the path that leads to a blessed life. Blessed are those who walk according to God's word because it is life-giving. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this initial jump into Psalm 119. There is just so much here, Lord. But it is a good reminder for us that when we sin, we feel shame. And that's a natural thing we should feel. But you want us to deal with that sin, to deal with that shame, because your son Jesus paid the price to be able to make it right so we could deal with it. So God, I pray. I pray for those who are listening. I pray that you, that your spirit would convict them, that they would take the steps they need to deal with the shame in their life so that they could get back to being on the narrow road and find life worth living. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope that our time in God's word, our time of worship has been really helping you to engage God in a new and fresh way. Uh, maybe it's reminded you about the importance of God's word uh, or just the importance of being in community together. We'd love to have uh, you join us again next week uh, right here, or what you could do is come in person. All of our services are at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and we have a full children's ministry available as well. And we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless Southridge.